introduction and for inviting me. Um, yes, so um, we uh, are interested in understanding the uh, brain mechanisms underlying language, uh, in particular uh, word learning and word processing. So the, uh, we started from uh, uh, a theory, a uh, neurobiological theory of, of uh, word learning, which has been proposed uh, over the past 15, 20 years, and which has quite a, again quite a lot of um, experimental support. Uh, and the theory, the idea is, is rather simple. So what happens when, uh, when uh, children start uh, uh, to learning how to speak? So when they start bubbling and, and early word learning, what happens is uh, articulation of a syllable or of a word leads to activity in the inferior frontal lobe on the left side specifically here. And at the same time, the sounds produced by this, the articulation of this syllable, are perceived uh, by the uh, superior temporal lobe, by the auditory cortex and the areas that are uh, sensitive to uh, speech perception. So uh, the theory says, well, uh, when you have concomitant activity in the brain and you have Hebbian learning mechanism, what happens is that these patterns of activity will get associated together. And so this leads to the emergence of strongly connected ensembles of neurons which are distributed over these perisylvian areas, so areas around the sylvian fissure. And, and these, these uh, structures, these cell assemblies, have been hypothesized already a long time ago by Hebb in, in, uh, in the last century, and also more recently have been called by Fusser as action perception circuits. But the idea is that these set of cells are strongly and reciprocally connected and emerge as a result of learning, Hebbian learning. So now, just uh, what, I, what I mentioned is the uh, emergence of a circuit which associates articulation with uh, auditory with sound perception, but I haven't said anything about meaning. So how do we learn the meaning of, of these words, of these uh, uh, circuits that, that emerge? So uh, by mean of the same mechanism, so again, happy learning, uh, uh, we take the view that uh, language acquisition is in the sensory motor experience. So basically when a new word form emerges in the brain, then its activation correlates with the presence of sensory perception or motor action. Uh, and so these distributed cell assembly now link up with the corresponding uh, uh, activities in the corresponding sensory or motor cortices. So for example, when we have uh, when we learn the meaning of a word which has a very strong visual component, what will happen is typically in this learning situation, the use of the word uh, uh, co-occur with the presence of the object in the environment. So the, the child will, will use the word or will hear the word at the same time as the object is being perceived. And I'm showing here, for example, the identity of the object, which is represented by in the, vin in the ventral stream, uh, in the ventral visual stream. So at the same time, we have, therefore, activity in the perisivian areas here. And so the co-presence of this activity leads to uh, a larger cell assembly circuit, which now includes both perisivian and extra sylvian uh, circuits, in particularly in the uh, temporal lobe, in the visual uh, ventral stream of the uh, visual cortex. And the same thing, the same idea goes for when we learn the meaning of action-related words. So words which have a strong action component uh, typically are learned while the action is being executed. So action execution leads to activity in the uh, pre-central, post-central, and prefrontal as well, and premotor uh, cortices. Now when this activation co-occur with the word circuit activation, so with the usage of the word, then the cell assembly extends from just the perisilian area and binds with cells which are active in the motor cortex. So the interesting point here is that the cell assembly now, there is a strong neuroimaging evidence that shows they are automatically reactivated. So when we hear a word, which is, for example, an action word, like kick or pick, then activity in the motor cortex uh, lights up automatically and even without the need to pay attention. So, so this is basically the idea is that the meaning of a word is grounded in the motor cortex, in this case, or in the sensory cortex, in the, visual, in the case of visual object words. So, uh, again, to maybe summarize, what are the brain areas 
therefore, that I'm considering for the purpose of this talk, uh, which are relevant for word learning and meaning. So during word learning, information about articulation leaves the inferior motor cortex there, the part of the primary motor cortex in the inferior strip. At the same time, the perception of the corresponding sounds activates, activates neurons in the primary auditory cortex. At the same time, if we perceive a visual object, then information comes in through the visual cortex. And if we execute an action, a motor movement, in this case, a hand or an arm movement, is typically controlled by the dorsolateral part of the motor strip. So we have information also leaving that. So activity there, which then, of course, is carried down to the mus muscles and to the movement. Now, these areas, these four primary areas, uh, are actually neuroatomically connected. And so what I uh, highlighted here in colors are the cortical areas through which bundles of fibers uh, uh, go, which enable linking up of these four primary areas. So these areas were for us relevant in trying to simulate the acquisition of action or visual, visually related words. And so that's what we did. So we identified these cortical areas relevant for uh, uh, modeling, learning of words, initially only word circuits, phonological word circuits, and then to the extension of these two words with a meaning, either a visual related meaning or an action related meaning. And here we, we therefore built a model which replicates carefully the connections that we know exist in the brain between these cortical areas. So um, now let me give you a bit of a details about the model. I don't have much time to go into much details, but I like to stress that all the uh, components of the model are neurobiologically realistic. And, and as I mentioned, the connections are, have been implemented because of existing neuroanatomical evidence for such links. So each area here is actually consists of two layers of uh, excitatory and inhibitory cells, excitatory cells. In this case, the, mo the, la the latest version of the model that we have is actually a spiking uh, version. Uh, one important thing to say is that the links between the areas and also within recurrent links are not all to all as many uh, neural network models assume, but are actually random uh, and sparse and topographic. Uh, for which we know uh, that's the case also in the cortex. Uh, here I'm just showing you how these projections from one cell in a certain area uh, actually uh, are topographic. So, so the one cell projects to a, a, a set of neurons uh, which is co topographically corresponding in another area and uh, the probability of two synapses to be created falls off with a distance, again, for which we know there is evidence in the cortex. So essentially, this, this we try to, uh, by, by using this topographic sparse uh, and random uh, um, connectivity, to imitate the patchy, typical patchy patterns of, of uh, synaptic connectivity that, that are found in the mammalian brain. And for example, just to give you an idea, uh, what, I, what I'm showing here is actually uh, an example of cluster fibers in, 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 uh, in uh, V1, in primary visual cortex, showing where the synaptic uh, um, connections between a, a, a neuron and other uh, neurons nearby happen. And so here, what I was representing by the gray cells was exactly the same. So the points where each cell was making contact with other cells. So maybe you can hopefully see a resemblance between uh, this type of uh, projections. Right, uh, so just briefly to mention, of course, the two layers of excitatory inhibitory cells are closely coupled uh, by means of which we actually implement lateral inhibition. And there are also global inhibition circuits which regulate uh, the total activity within the network, but I'm not depicting these here. Finally, um, as I mentioned, the model of a single neuron is, is just a leaky integrate and fire neuron with adaptation. Um, don't want to go into the details, but you can find these in the publications. And finally, importantly, the learning rule. So the model, uh, as I mentioned, uh, contains uh, happy and learning plasticity, uh, which is voltage-based 
and non-homeostatic. And this is essentially a rule which is based on uh, the postsynaptic membrane potential. There are two thresholds and one threshold for the presynaptic firing rate and is based on the LTP, LTD model of uh, Artola and Singer. So, sorry, I just skipped the references. And one final detail is that uh, the spike driven version of this rule basically means that we apply those synaptic changes only when there is either a pre or a postsynaptic spike. So notice that this is not a direct implementation of spike time dependent plasticity, but uh, it's a voltage based rule, but it's spike driven. Okay, so uh, how did we simulate the actual uh, semantic grounding uh, of object-related words. Well, we, we took the model and, as you can imagine, we presented triplets of patterns, which we interpret as being sensory motor patterns. And, of course, in the case of an object-related word, we have co-occurrence of auditory, articulatory, and visual perception. And in the case of an action-related word, we stimulated the network repeatedly with patterns, again, auditory and articulatory, and to the motor cortex part of the network, represented the execution of a movement. And what we observed after many repetitions, we're talking about 2,000 or 2000, 3,000 uh, presentation of each triplet, what we observed is the emergence of such cell assembly circuits, which I mentioned at the beginning, these, these uh, 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 theoretical uh, construct which have been hypothesized, and actually we observed this, and you can see here I'm showing in white, I don't know if everyone can see, the, the cells which belong to one example of such a circuit uh, in, in, this, in the 12 area network. And as you can see, uh, the cell assembly extends from these six bottom perisylvian areas to the top uh, extracylvian areas, in this case being stimulated only on the right hand side by the uh, motor area, the cell assembly extends towards this direction, but in the other case, when we have object-related words, then of course we have the cell assembly which extends in the other, on the other side. So now I'm just briefly going to show you a sequence of snapshots showing what happens after learning such type of words, what happens to these circuits when you only stimulate them with the auditory pattern, so which corresponds to perceiving the sound of a word. So you can see now the network re responds initially here, in the auditory cortex, and then information quickly spreads. These are uh, different simulation time steps to the rest of the entire circuits. So there is a, what we call ignition of the cell assembly, which, as you can see at this time point, there is no input, but the circuit is self-sustaining, and there are, because of course of the recurrent and, and uh, positive feedback loops which exist between all of these uh, cells, excitatory cells. And one important thing to note is that the pattern which had been of course associated here, the visual pattern in the visual cortex, is partly, not entirely, but partly reproduced uh, by the ignition of the cell assembly. Right, so which is a desirable phenomenon of course of pattern reconstruction. And after the presentation, the cell assembly switches off due to the uh, inhibition mechanism. Now, um, I have a short video showing you what happens if you uh, actually uh, present, again, uh, a stimulus here, but not only for a short time, but if you keep it present there uh, in the auditory cortex input, you will see the cell assembly igniting as soon as this button is clicked. Right, so this is uh, what happens there is, we used in this simulation a large amount of noise just to make it a bit more realistic. And the in, one interesting thing is that actually the ignition and switching off of cell assemblies uh, uh, spontaneously happen in the gamma range. So this is a, a nice thing. Okay, so what, uh, what can this model do? Uh, well, using this or previous versions of the model, uh, we explained quite a, a range of different data, including uh, uh, experimental data on 
audit, automatic auditory change detection, um, also effects of attention on the brain responses to word and pseudo words, uh, and as I mentioned, different oscillatory responses to words and pseudo words, and also uh, the spontaneous emergence of the topography of memory cells and the emergence of in, case, in this case of free, what I would call free decision to speak and act. So the model explains this uh, by simple uh, uh, spontaneous ignition of these cell assemblies, we, we can explain why certain areas, in particular pre inferior prefrontal cortex and posterior superior, superior temporal cortex, are those which, where activity happens previous to uh, speech, uh, so speech production. And so the model explains this. So in a way, I'd like to say that this, this model, although had been designed for, for uh, explaining language processes and language acquisition, goes beyond uh, its original design. But now let me go back to the theme of this talk, which is meaning and how we learn the meaning of words. So uh, one thing which the model and the results that we have actually helped explain is the question of why there are areas in the brain which care about different types of categories. So there are specifically areas in the brain, for example, uh, the motor cortex, which, as I mentioned, respond specifically to categories of action words and not to visual words. And vice versa, there are areas around the visual cortex which ignite, which uh, 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 exhibit activity when we hear a word which has a strong visual component, such as sun, for example. And in the other case, such as if we hear run, we would have activation there. On the other hand, there is a, an issue which is that there are other words, other areas in the brain which uh, uh, are normally known as, as, typically known as semantic hubs, which seem to be active regardless of which uh, semantic category uh, is being uh, perceived or processed. And so these, these semantic hubs essentially, which are typically, there are different ones, but here, for example, inferior from prefrontal cortex or also anterior temporal pole and the posterior middle temporal gyrus seem to uh, care for general uh, uh, semantics, so for general meaning. And how can, how can we explain the presence of both of these types of cortical areas? Well, that's what our dissociation uh, that we found previously in the model shows. So basically the cell assemblies exhibit a double dissociation in their distribution. So if we look at the, the visual cortical areas, B1 and, and temporal occipital areas, you'll see that in the case of an object word, cell assembly reach that, those areas, but they don't show much presence in case of an action word. And vice versa, in case of a, uh, in case, if we look at uh, cor uh, uh, cortical regions where the motor cortex is, so around M1, dorsal M1, and premotor cortex, there is almost no activity due to object word cell assembly, but there are very strong cell assembly for the action words. Now, this is basically explains Obviously, if you, if you want, why there are uh, category-specific uh, cortices. But now, one interesting point is what happens in these semantic hubs. So if you look at these two, uh, these two types of cell assemblies, you see that both types of circuits, so for object or for action words, they coexist within these uh, four central areas, specifically within the semantic hubs in the uh, um, uh, anterior temporal lobe and the prefrontal cortex. And why is that the case? Well, obviously because of the connectivity. So the cell assemblies are allowed by the connection between these hubs, by these connecting hubs, to extend, to freely extend also to areas which are not necessarily uh, needed for connecting the, the, the pattern. So if we're talking, for example, about an action word linking this pattern to this one and this one, uh, the cell assembly does not necessarily need to go through this hub. However, because of the connectivity and because of the properties of cell assembly growth, which is spontaneous and, and, and driven by Hebbian learning, the cell assembly spontaneously grows also in that area. And so the co-presence of of uh, equally strong circuits for both categories in these uh, semantic hubs leads to the impression that these hubs are actually general. Where, whereas what we are suggesting here is actually what we see is the co-presence of different circuits in the same cortical areas. Uh, okay.
very brief mention that we tested this model in an fMRI experiment. We, we showed uh, participant uh, pictures of, of animals, uh, so visual uh, words and, and of actions, and we associated them with novel words. So we, we tried to teach them the meaning of novel words by pairing the sound of these words with either pictures of animals or pictures of hand actions. And when we looked at the brain responses, what we find was here, these are the areas which respond more strongly to the animal pictures or object pictures. And if we then stimulate them, we present them the words that they learned, this is what we find. So if you compare the two, there is a reactivation in the visual cortex. So the visual cortex, which represents the pictures when these are perceived, is now reactivated by the perception of the learned word. And what is interesting is that there is nothing there for the action words. So the action words produce no activity in the visual cortex. And so this strongly confirms the model prediction and the theory. So in summary, I presented the neuromechanistic model which attempts to, to simulate word learning and semantic grounding solely on the basis of three elements, sensory motor experience, Hebbian mechanisms, and connectivity structure, and these three components lead to specific cell assembly distributions, which in turn explain the emergence in the cortex of two different types of area, category specific and general semantic apps. So category specific is basically what is known to be embodied theory, embodied cognition, whereas general semantic apps, if you accept the term, are disembodied. So the model explains both. Maybe I'll stop here and <laughs> leave this for you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so Habian learning in this case the, does not use homeostatic mechanism. I think that what you want to hear is network self-regulatory mechanisms. So global inhibition is, I think, the closest that would uh, probably be, I don't know if you would call global inhibition an homeostatic mechanism, but that basically prevents the network from exploding or having, uh, uh, yeah, epileptic uh, uh, behavior basically, or from dying, from, from having no uh, activity at all. But there is no other, uh, no other homeostatic mechanism in the, in the synaptic plasticity mechanism. So global inhibition, I think that's the answer that probably to your first question. And the other question is, um, so it depends what you mean by, so, so what phenomenon, you mean, if we still want to have this distinction between category specific yeah, and. Right, so. Right, so spiking is definitely not necessary because we have a, a version of the model which is perfectly, actually, that the first version was graded response. So we introduced spiking to make it more realistic, but uh, that's not necessary. Um, the connectivity, the, 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 basically the, ma the replication of the cortical connectivity, I think is crucial. So if you, if you don't have a network which reflects the, uh, the existing uh, structure of the cortical areas that we are simulating, then of course uh, we, we, can, we cannot claim that this structure leads to such distributions. So if we change the connectivity, if we change the structure of the network, then uh, of course the, the distribution of the cell assemblies would change. And um, yeah, one thing which maybe I should mention, which is important, is also the presence of noise, so neuronal noise. And that's why actually the cell assembly circuits do not extend to the sort of, so to speak, silent branch. Uh, 
So here, when we present the three patterns here, the cell assembly extends here, it grows, but it does not go there. And the only reason why it doesn't go there is because there is noise. So if there was no noise, if that area was silent, the cell assembly would spontaneously grow also into that branch. And in fact, this is in line with uh, some data from congenitally blind uh, um, uh, people who exhibit responses in the visual cortex when they hear words. That could be explained by the growth, by the spontaneous growth of these cell assembly circuits in areas which are silent, which are not. Uh, so to speak, suppressed by noise. Okay, um, I, I, there were other questions, but we are sort of out of time, so I'd like to thank the uh, speaker again. Yeah.